So I think you've seen, uh, obviously, the, uh, the budget address by the Minister of, of Finance about uh, recovering together as a province, getting out of, you know, getting beyond uh, COVID and recovering from some of those things. And obviously, strengthening our health care is very, is the most important thing in this budget. Um, investing in communities and making life more affordable for Manitobans, as well as uh, building our economy. So those are the main things here, and uh, why don't I just throw it up out for questions for you. Um, you spoke shortly after you were uh, elected the leader and became premier of calming the waters. Do you see the budget as, as accomplishing some of that in terms of providing some money for health care? There's some tax cuts. I do see this actually as, as calming the waters. I think what we want to do out there is make sure that we are making life more affordable for Manitobans while at the same time ensuring that we're making those significant investments to get, you know, to, to reduce and, and to tackle those backlogs when it comes to surgical and diagnostic procedures. We've heard loud and clear from Manitobans that they want that to be a priority and that's why we've made this a priority in our budget. And given the fact that we're expecting more waves of COVID-19, has the money that you put aside for things like ICU bed increases, additional nursing training, and uh, hospital capacity, surgical backlogs, is, is that enough? Because it, it sounds like the budget, well, it looks like the budget dedicates less money than last year to COVID, and we're not, we're not done with COVID. Right, and, and what it does though this year is that it puts some of the, that within uh, the budget itself, but also has those contingencies, the $630 million that you're talking about with respect to COVID itself, but there's other contingencies as well. So obviously with COVID, we, we do anticipate that that will cover off uh, some of those things primarily. Um, and again, we've set aside $110 million in the budget towards um, tackling the surgical and diagnostic backlogs, but let me be very clear about this. We will do whatever it takes to ensure that we give the resources uh, to those who need it to tackle those uh, diagnostics uh, and uh, surgical backlogs. That is an absolute priority for our government. You know, two key themes, I guess, you spoke about health care, but also affordability. We've heard about uh, the, the education property tax rebate, a further reduction, uh, a further increase in that, rather, as well as the, the renter's uh, tax credit. Do you see any other measures in here that really address, you know, the rising prices of food and fuel? For I think the very fact that we've indexed everything to inflation when we're in the inflationary uh, uh, pressures uh, system that we're in right now. Um, obviously, we need to look to our federal government to help out a lot in that. This is nothing that is unique to Manitoba. Inflation affects everybody uh, around the world, but we wanted to ensure that we offer those individuals, um, you know, some relief in the way of, uh, you know, the education taxes on property, uh, but also extending that to, to renters. And then all of the other things that we've indexed to inflation all adds up, and that will be uh, significant uh, in the pockets of Manitobans. And, and, and why go ahead with cutting taxes at a time when we're still looking at a deficit of over a half billion dollars and you have COVID. Well, we, we chose not to accelerate it at the pace that it was before. And so, um, and we did that for a reason because we're still in very difficult times. Uh, but we think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can make those significant investments in healthcare uh, to tackle those diagnostic and surgical backlogs, as well as providing uh, money to put back into the pockets of Manitobans. Uh, I think, you know, with, with the way um, things are with uh, inflation, uh, inflationary pressures around the world. Manitobans are, are feeling that much more than, than maybe they, they would have before. I mean, we've got the situation in Ukraine, we've got other pressures that are adding to this, the affordability for Manitobans, and we need to ensure that we, uh, that we provide them with the supports that they need, and we believe that this is a way we can do it this year. Why isn't the government able to give us a target date for when the surgical backlog target will be set? Well, I believe, yeah, the, task, the surgical and diagnostic task force has addressed that, and so the doctors will leave that up to them. They're the experts of how they're going to roll this out within the system to do it as quickly as possible. I think that it's, it's our job to ensure that we give them the tools that they need. And so that's why we have, you know, we have announced today that we're investing $110 million towards the reduction of the surgical and diagnostic backlogs. But again, I'll be clear. 
um, we will do whatever it takes to ensure that we tackle those surgical and diagnostic backlogs. We will work very closely with the task force to ensure we do that. We've heard loud and clear from Manitobans that this is a priority and it's a priority for us as well. But why not set a, a, like a, a goal? Like it doesn't seem like there's any, the, the, the goal is to, to clear the backlog, but a goal in terms of some measurable thing that can be met by, is it going to be five years? Is it going to be 10 years? Is it going to be two years? Like, just I want to do it as quickly as possible. And again, I would look to the task force. I believe they've addressed that already. They are the experts that are working within the system itself. And I want to take my advice from them. We want to make sure that this is a realistic way that we're going to uh, reduce the surgical and diagnostic backlogs. And, and we will work with them. Believe me, we want to make sure they've got the tools that they need to get the job done and we will work with them towards that end. Seems like uh, funding for Indigenous and Northern communities stayed around, stayed pretty flat with about $30 million or so. Why no increase in funding for, the, for that portfolio? For we, are, we are certainly making investments. Uh, reconciliation is an absolute priority for our government as well and we did announce uh, some monies towards uh, that, additional monies towards that. Uh, through the clan mothers and, and others and what uh, what is going on uh, what they're doing um, in this in this way but what we also need to do is we need to be listening um, to those uh, with lived experience out there we need to be li listening to uh, those in our indigenous communities who have been negatively impacted as a result of residential schools and other things out there so we need to listen to those and, and so there are additional monies for that no uh, supervised consumption site in this budget either something that a lot of people were hopeful for um, maybe talk a little bit about what the decision to keep supervised consumption out of this budget uh, for, for So now. what we do know is that uh, the RAM clinics have been very successful and so we have chosen to invest further, make further investments in this budget uh, in those RAM clinics. Uh, again, we are about getting re results. Uh, for Manitobans, those have provided positive results for those who have been suffering from mental health um, and addictions problems, and so we'll continue to make investments to ensure that we get the best outcomes for Manitobans. We're in the worst drug poisoning crisis Manitoba has ever seen. How does this budget increase beds for recovery services and withdrawals? Yeah, I think that's, that is outlined uh, in the budget. We'll get uh, the details to you. There are some additional supports in those areas. $17 million more uh, in mental health and addictions uh, budget to address uh, those very issues. Yeah, th those are, again, those will be rolled out over the course of the next little while. I mean, this, again, this is about, um, you know, announcing some of the monies towards these things. There will be other programs coming forward and other announcements that will come as a result of, of the monies that have been set out in the budget today. So, so many more um, good news, I think, announcements for people with, with mental health and addictions problems and as well as those who are waiting, you know, for, for surgeries and, and diagnostic procedures as well. Um, Premier, just one last thing, you know, uh, Minister Friesen had said that it, it seems like this is kind of one of the last budgets kind of in a pandemic era. For you as Premier, how does it feel to know that this might be kind of the last potentially pandemic era, era budget where now it's kind of next year's budget? Forward, so to speak. Well, I think what's important is that um, we don't know necessarily what's going to happen in the future and that we are setting aside contingencies to ensure that we're ready to, to deal uh, with whatever else we might be, be dealt with. I mean, we know we've got potentially a significant uh, weather, like a storm maybe coming in the next couple of days. I mean, how does this affect, uh, you know, potential flooding coming up? There are contingencies within this budget to deal with those things as well. So, um, you know, we'll continue to deal with it on a day-by-day -day and an hour-by-hour -hour basis. Thanks, everyone.